The Kitab al Ibar was the nominal reference to Im Khaldun in Dun. But by digging deeper, we can find much more. As it has been said earlier, Frank Herbert has spent countless days studying ancient desert tribes. And Im Khaldun's Muqaddima was arguably the best material source for him. The palpable tension between desert tribesmen out of the reach and control of the civilized empire, which is discussed in depth in the Muqaddima to describe Arabs, Amazigh, or Turco-Mongol tribes, is one of the most suggestive influences from Im Khaldun that we can observe in Dun. For those unfamiliar with the Muslim thinker, he wrote that human groups spontaneously create wealth in two ways to survive. On the one hand, agriculture, which ties them to a land that later on will become a city, a place for sedentary life and ultimately luxury. On the other hand, animal husbandry, which requires constant movement and will naturally transform humans into nomads in harsh environments like deserts or steppes. That division will have deep economic, political, sociological, and moral consequences. It is very easy to compare the world of Dune and the Arab world with their desertic landscapes, all the multiple terms borrowed from Arabic in the book, like jihad, sharia, ilm, fiqh, aql, dar al-hikmah, hajj, shaitan, etc. But the comparison we can draw is regarding the relationship between nomadic tribal cultures and sedentary cultures. As Im Khaldun had written 600 years ago, both types of societies complement each other and behave according to a cycle, which we will cover more in depth later. In Dune, the character development of the Fremen is heavily inspired by how Im Khaldun used to describe Arabs and Amazigh cultures in the Maghrib. For example, Fremen men were Burnus and their women Abayas, and sometimes with exotic twists, like the Fremen riding giant sandworms instead of camels. There is also a hint in the very name of Freeman. It is obvious that it's a wordplay based on the two words free man, but what is less known is that it's a literal English translation of the name Amazigh, the native people of the Maghrib or Northwest Africa. The names of both Amazigh and Freeman are a suggestion that they are an independent rebellious tribe who will never permit themselves to be dominated by outsiders. Beyond the name and the culture, Dune also describes the Freeman in the very same ambivalent way Im Khaldun used to describe Arabs. A Western Orientalist eye would see them portrayed as romanticized primitive people, but this is not so. For Im Khaldun, just like for Dune characters, desert tribal groups are perceived by city dwellers as savage, violent, and destructive. But on the other hand, they have a stronger group feeling. They are more brave, more capable of self-defense and survival, as they are not protected by a state or an army, they have developed their own defense mechanisms. Quote unquote. Their women are as fierce as the men. Even freemen children are violent and dangerous. You'll not be permitted to mingle with them, I dare say. End of quote. As we said, they are less morally corrupt than city dwellers because they are not exposed to their luxuries. They have a code of honor and do not lie because there is not much material incentive to do so like in cities. Just like Arab and Berber tribesmen, they are perceived as tough, proud, and relatively egalitarian. The harshness of their environment, desertic and mountainous areas of the Maghreb and Arrakis, has given them an ethic of strong fellowship and mutual aid. Unlike in comfortable and luxurious cities, nobody can survive alone in the desert. Quote unquote. The free man must be brave to live at the edge of the desert. As Im Khaldun described, those tribes, as they are out of the reach of a central power, are the hardest to control and tax, because taxation is considered by them as the ultimate humiliation. As Im Khaldun says, quote unquote, this shows most clearly what asabiya, or group feeling, means. Asabiya produces the ability to defend oneself. Whoever loses asabiya is too weak to do any of these things. A tribe paying imposts did not do that until it became resigned to make submission with respect to paying them. Imposts and taxes are a sign of oppression and meekness which proud souls do not tolerate. When one sees a tribe humiliated by the payment of imposts, one cannot hope that it will ever achieve royal authority. End of quote. On the other hand, in the novel, quote unquote, I, Stilgar, am one who does not pay the fai, the water tribute to the Harkonnens. End of quote. Desert dwellers are also constantly in a fasting state according to Im Khaldun. And we do know that the freemen practice Ramadan as a way to strengthen their spiritual fortitude by experiencing scarcity. There is a video on that very topic. On the other hand, city dwellers are more sophisticated in culture, arts, and crafts and live in overabundance. 
but at the same time, they are more submissive and weak, as they have delegated their own defense to a royal authority or an army. What they gain in knowledge, they lose in wisdom, because they have less and less skin in the game by being protected from risk by a state." Quote unquote. I heard you have a saying, Paul said, that Polish comes from the cities, wisdom from the desert. End of quote. One of the most profound influence of Ibn Khaldun on Dune is the concept of Asabiya. It can be seen in the emphasis on unity, group feeling, and shared purpose among the freemen. Ibn Khaldun's concept of Asabiya is the narrative backbone that undergeared the political and social consistency of Frank Herbert's Dune. As it has been said before, enemies of Paul, the alleged protagonist, are extremely powerful and wealthy. If we give a first look at the political forces in the book, it is virtually impossible for him to defeat them. His individual power is not enough. He will need the help of others, thousands and then millions. He will need social power, he will need Asabiya, the social glue that binds individuals into cohesive social groups. Because in human history, all other things being equal, Groups with greater asabiya are able to impose their will on groups with lower asabiya. How do people develop asabiya, and how do they lose it? Im Khaldun says that the desert is the ideal place for it. Only groups with high levels of solidarity can survive and thrive in this harsh environment. In contrast, in comfortable and luxurious urban civilizations, asabiya naturally decays and disappears generation after generation, because people can survive on their own. They don't need to train to defend themselves, they no longer need a family to survive, and they don't need to hunt or plant their own food. Individualism or selfishness naturally flourish, which makes people lose their ability for concrete collective action. Im Khaldun himself, as a politician, went to the desert to seek the help or the protection of local tribes, or when he needed mercenaries. This is what Paul Atreides will do with the free men on planet Arrakis. Arrakis, a desert planet, is a perfect environment to impose a natural selection regime under which only the toughest and the most cooperative tribes survive. Quote unquote. My duty is the strength of the tribe, Stilgar said. That is my only duty. I need no one to remind me of it. End of quote. So Paul will be able to benefit from the power of Freeman Asabir. But there is a problem. It will not be enough. While Asabir is a great glue to unify one tribe, it will not be enough to unify all desert tribes under one banner, to defeat the galactic emperor Shaddam and the Harkonnens. Paul Atreides will need something else, something that will glue tribes together. Imhaldun says that desert Bedouins are the people who are the least likely to subordinate to a leader. Indeed, they would rightfully question the leader and say, why you and not me? But the Muslim polymath provides a solution to that issue, quote unquote. Desert Arabs are the least willing of nations to subordinate themselves to each other. Their individual aspirations rarely coincide. But when there is religion among them, through prophecy or sainthood, then they have some restraining influence in themselves. When there is a prophet or a saint among them who calls upon them to fulfill the commands of Allah and raise them of blameworthy qualities and causes them to adopt praiseworthy ones, they become fully united and obtain superiority and royal authority. Besides, no people are as quick as the Arabs to accept religious truth and right guidance because their natures have been preserved free from the distorted habits of cities." End of quote. This is exactly how Islam expanded and prevailed from Spain to Western China. After fighting against the two superpowers of the time, the Byzantine and the Persian Sassanid empires, under a great unifier like Muhammad Wasallam. When one looks at the state of the Arabs before Islam, the Prophet's ability to unify them was truly a miracle, quote unquote. Our Prophet wrote no greater miracle than the Qur'an and the fact that he united the Arabs in his mission. If he had expanded all the treasures on earth, he would have achieved no unity among them. But Allah achieved unity among them, Qur'an chapter 8, verse 63. Long story short, Im Khaldun suggests that Paul Atreides needs not only group feeling, but also religion to be able to establish a political and military force strong enough to rival the established power. The world religion has two disputed etymology, both from Latin. One would be religere, which means to read again. Legere has given the word lecture, but much more interestingly, another origin of the word is religare, which means to bind and give the world rely. 
an interesting origin when we see religion not only as a personal faith, but also a social bond with other fellow humans, and as an extra glue reinforcing al sabia which will enhance people's hardiness. Quote unquote. Religion and law in our masses must be one and the same. This will have the dual benefit of bringing both greater obedience and greater bravery. We must depend not so much on the bravery of individuals, you see, as upon the bravery of a whole population." End of quote. Paul Atreides will then become the quote-unquote prophet Paul Muad'Dib and be in position to overthrow the emperor. One side note, the term religion here should not necessarily be taken at face value, but rather replaced by transcendent ideology. Because post quote unquote enlightenment ideology in the 20th century, although not religious, have played a significant role in cementing human groups, shaping their view of the world for the best and the worst. We have seen now the crucial roles of desert life, asabiya, and religion among human groups. Their major consequence is that, according to both Imkhaldun and Herbert, they make history follow a cycle, a pattern. 